So Jillian asked me to come today and talk about MSX, which is an oyster disease. Um, and kind of, you know, we had an experience with MSX in the past and um, I think her idea was more to, you know, how did we survive that and how did we come out better on the other end? So um, I got thinking about it and I thought that it would be fun to talk about um, disease kind of in a broader context. and my experience with disease and really kind of on a philosophical level. I think as, you know, as a shellfish farmer, I have a unique perspective of disease. I've had um, a fair amount of, um, you know, different episodes where we've had, had disease with shellfish. But, you know, with, um, with agriculture, you can spray chemicals, um, herbicides and pesticides. And um, in horticulture, you can use antibiotics and vaccines to uh, keep your animals safe. But with shellfish, it's more kind of organic. Like we can't do that. Once they're out in the environment, there's just no way to kind of apply any type of protection. Um, so that's been, you know, that's kind of where my perspective on, on shellfish disease has, has originated from. Um, so I thought, you know, I, I, I kind of had a couple of goals today. And one would be to just kind of hopefully um, inspire a lot of thought of, uh, you know, about disease and what it means to all of us. It was 1995, that was the year I got hit with, uh, with QPX and really, de you know, devastated. But it was also the first year that I bought oyster seed, which was a strange choice because there are wild clams in Duxbury, but there were no wild oysters. So when I bought that first batch of little tiny oyster seed, I didn't even know if they would grow. I didn't know if I'd put them in the water in Duxbury Bay and they would all die. Or, you know, I didn't know what to expect. The cool part was they grew a lot faster than clams. So I would check them like every few days and be like, oh my God, they're growing. <laughs> I was told by Dick Krause, the guy from the hatchery, that there were two main oyster diseases that would wipe me out before I sold any oysters at all. So, um, you know, from more of a personal, like, um, philosophical, standpoint it it made me question what I was doing um, also my girlfriend was pregnant so, so all these crazy things happening all at once and I was shellfishing to pay the bills and really just didn't know how I was gonna continue on and um, do any of you know Dana Hale our sales girl so I lived at her house when she was 13 years old and her dad is a serial entrepreneur and uh, just a, a good friend and he loved what I was doing and thought it was so cool. And uh, I can remember after the disease, days after the disease, I ran into Bob Hale out on the lawn. So they had this little guest house that I lived in and I ran into him and um, he said, well, what are you gonna do now? And I said, ah, I don't know. I think maybe I'm gonna get a job. And he laughed and started walking away. He said, a job? He said, you're unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> And every time I tell that story, everybody thinks, oh, what a terrible thing to say. But I knew what he meant. He meant, you're an entrepreneur. Don't be an idiot. You're not going to get a job. You're never going to be happy getting a job. You need to double down and figure out what you're going to do. And, and that's what he would have done. You know, he would have he told you that he'd been through terrible hard times in starting his business and that he would have figured it out. And uh, I think, you know, as terrible as it sounds, it's one of the best compliments I've, I've ever received. <laughs> There's two main oyster diseases that were there years before um, QPX, um, which is cohogs. But these, what I'm trying to say is these diseases existed for a long time before I got into it. The first is MSX, which is the one that we were going to talk about today. Um, mononucleated spear unknown. Um, doesn't mean anything to me either. Um, so MSX is a protozoan parasite. So it's actually a single-celled animal that um, goes in, it affects the tissue, and then uh, multiplies within. And then when the animal dies, it ex the cyst explodes, and they'll go out. So it's not a, a bacteria. Um, there are bacteria like uh, I'm thinking JOD, but like uh, Vibrio. Vibrio parahemolyticus, that's a bacteria, and that, uh, that is what we'll, we have to be really careful about in the summer. Uh, so that can call, cause illnesses, but it actually doesn't hurt the oyster. Hmm. Yeah, so um, most of these diseases that infect the oyster hurt the oyster if they won't 
infect people, but that bacteria will infect people and not the oyster. Red tide is something totally different. It's actually a, a phytoplankton, so it's a, an algae that's out in the water. And it, again, the oysters can eat it. They can actually get some nutrition from it, um, but they accumulate it in their gut, and when we eat it, it's toxic to us. MSX was hit the Chesapeake Bay in the 1950s, late 50s, and um, in the first three years. So in the Chesapeake, they say that when the first settlers showed up here, that there were so many oysters in the Chesapeake Bay that they could filter the whole volume of water in three days. So a staggering amount, that the water was crystal clear. You could see down 30 or 40 feet. Now you can't see into the water, and it takes five to 600 days for the oysters to filter the same volume of water. Um, probably why most of the early settlement took place down there was because there was this massive, easy source of protein. Um, anyway, that's another conversation. <laughs> but uh, but in, the, uh, in the late 50s, the M when MSX hit, it wiped out over more than 90% of the oysters. So you can imagine it was just devastating. And it moved out from there and moved up and down the coast from the Chesapeake. Um, in 1995, when my clams died, um, I was asking around about who to get information from. And ironically, <coughs> excuse me, there was a marine biological lab in Duxbury that I didn't know what they, really what they did. They, shellfish wasn't their thing, but there was this kind of famous shellfish pathologist that had an office there. And his name was Bob, Bob Hillman. So I went over and introduced myself and uh, told him what happened. And he couldn't believe it. Of course, he was a little excited, but also being, you know, um, realizing that this was devastating to me. Um, but he told me that he actually did the histology on those clams. He was the one that looked at those clams. He went back and looked at the slides and found out that there wasn't anything in those clams when they came to Duxbury. Um, but I started talking about, about shellfish disease with Bob and got to know him and I, I would stop in there. We became really good friends and, um, you know, I'd stop in a couple of times a year and just check in with him. One day he told me this story that, so Bob was in his 70s when I met him and he said when he was a young grad student, I believe he was at the University of Maryland, that he worked on MSX when it first started. Um, so as a grad student, it was expanding out of the Chesapeake Bay. So they knew where it was and where it wasn't. As a grad student, he had the boring job of taking oysters that came from a naive place, a control, and testing each one. So it's really monotonous. They had to slice it thin to do, um, make slides, to look at the slides, to see if they could detect the pathogen at all. Well, he had 100 oysters that he was working on, and he knew they, were, they weren't infected, they weren't exposed. So he, as a grad student, went you know, meticulously through each one. <coughs> and he got through something like 92 of these oysters. And then he had to go home for Christmas break. So he threw the 92 oysters, in the, or the eight oysters, in the refrigerator, went home for two or three weeks for a break. He said he came back <coughs> excited as a young grad student. He thought, looking for something to do, he thought, well, I'll just finish up these eight oysters. All eight highly infected. It's completely improbable. There's no way. I mean, mathematically, there's no way that he looked at 92 and there was no disease. And in the last eight, they were highly infected. And I remember saying to him, what does it mean? And he said, I don't know. I've worked on this my whole life. And he said that he, said he believed that was true of, of disease in general, that we, we know so little about it. But... Uh, you know, he had some theories that maybe these pathogens have life cycles that we don't know about, that they go into something else, or they look benign when you look at them, but for some reason they can, they can turn on and all of a sudden become virulent. Why it happened in that fridge, I don't know, but I wonder if the same thing happened at the same time in the area that they came from. So MSX hit, again, a protozoan parasite, um, Something, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous, so meaning that it exists everywhere that, where there's an established population of oysters. That for some reason that year the water stayed really, really warm and um, the oysters got a little stressed and the MSX took over. And 
once it started causing mortalities, it's, it's, it's got to run its course before it stops. So Shore was in Chris Sherman's position when we had MSX. So he was running the wholesale company in Island Creek. And uh, we went back to the office. We had probably 10 people at the time and three or four trucks. And we had a decision to make because we were buying uh, probably three or four, maybe even five million oysters out of Duxbury, but that's all we were doing. You know, we had a decision to make because 80% of those oysters or 90% of those oysters were going to go away. So we talked a lot about what to do and um, we thought about laying everybody off and, you know, getting rid of all the trucks and trying to survive this time. We knew eventually we, you know, it would cycle out and we'd be able to grow oysters again for a time. Um, but the other option was that we would actually hire a couple new people, hire salespeople, and go out and buy oysters from other oyster farmers outside of Duxbury. And uh, it, was a, it was a hard choice for us. It wasn't really received all that well by the Duxbury growers, um, but it was what we did to survive. And uh, today there's now, so there was 10 people then, and I don't know, sealed four or five million oysters. And now I think we have 40 people that work at Island Creek, and we probably sell north of 10 million oysters a year, so all from you know, farms all over the country. So that's kind of how we responded to MSX on the wholesale side was, let's diversify. Let's not put all our eggs in one basket. And uh, I think that's how you have to look at these things, because we can't manage it the way that, you know, with antibiotics or vaccines or um, chemicals. Th there was that initial time when I found out that my clams had disease and I, I asked myself, you know, what does this mean? What is disease? And it's kind of interesting because from my perspective, from my experience, I still ask myself that all the time. Is it just an anomaly? Is it just like something unfortunate that happened to me? Like, was it God paying me back for being such a hellion as a kid? Uh, or is it something that that tests the population constantly to make that population actually healthier. You know, that the animals that we lose, the, the oysters that we lose, or any animals in the wild, like, is it just nature's way of saying, let's keep that, that stock really healthy, just to the best of, or the healthiest, the most adept? And um, I hope that, you know, my talk inspires you guys to think about this stuff too.